Unfortunately, most people view language as grammar and rules and concrete concepts. But we need to think about language differently. Recently, I spoke to Peter Gardenfors, Professor of Cognitive Science at Lund University in Sweden. His interest in language spans human evolution, human cognition, philosophy, and conceptual spaces. In this interview, we talk about some of the more abstract concepts of language and language learning, and I really hope that it changes the way that you see language. So, for people who don't know you and your work, could you just um, talk a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? I'm a cognitive scientist. Uh, basically, that means a jack of all trades. I mean, I combine philosophy with linguistics and psychology and computer science and, and everything. It's about theories of thinking. And one of my research areas is uh, how to describe meanings of words. That's called semantics. Uh, so I, I develop models for describing uh, meanings of words. The, the reason that I got in contact with you is because, is because actually... I don't know if you know of the website Reddit. No, I, I know of it, but I, I don't use it. Yeah, so basically on, on Reddit, there's a, um, there's a part of it which is all about linguistics. And okay. somebody asked the question, what is a book that you read that completely blew your mind about linguistics? And someone said, Peter Gardenfors, um Semantic Spaces. And I thought, wow, what is this, this thing? And then I, I read... Um, I read about you know your 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 ideas and it is kind of an incredible theory. I mean, could you could you explain what it means the, the geometry of meaning? Well, there are two basic traditions in linguistic. One is the Chomskyan one that focuses almost exclusively on on grammar. I mean, the grammatical structure of, of of language. And Chomsky is not really interested in the meanings of words. And then the other tradition is called cognitive linguistics that tries to find connections between between what what you think, what you hear, what you see, perception and memory and and, and so on, and how we use language. And as I see it, the meaning of words relate much more to the cognitive aspects than to the grammatical aspects of, of, of language. Could you, could you talk a bit more specifically about semantic spaces and about how how maybe meaning yeah. meaning could be based on geometry? Yeah. I mean, it's a wild yeah. concept. Yeah, I, I call them conceptual spaces, but, but um, uh, to give one simple example, consider colors. And we can describe our perception of colors in, in a space. I, I think many people are familiar with the color circle. I mean, there is red, blue, green, yellow, and it goes around like this. And, and then there is light, uh, white and dark. I mean, that's a, an, another dimension. And these two, the circle and the, the light dark, they form a kind of space. Uh, uh, it's actually like a double cone because the white part is not, not uh, you can't distinguish very many uh, white aspects and things. Uh, same applies to the black part. Uh, and the, the really reason this is, can be described as a space is that distances in this space correspond to similarity. So red and orange are, are close points in the space, by, why red and, and uh, uh, green are distant points, they are far away in the space. And that means that red and orange are similar, and red and green are, are not so similar. So space is, is a way of capturing our judgments of similarity. So far I haven't said anything about language. But now we can say that color words correspond to regions of this, of this um, color space. So red is part, one part of the color space, yellow is another part, and, and, and so on. And the meaning of color terms then correspond to regions of, of, of such spaces. I could talk about, I mean, there are other spaces like uh, high and low or, or warm and cold. They are very simple because they are only one dimensional. But color is interesting because it's, it's a bit more complicated. And my idea is that, is that the meaning of words somehow depend on structures, these uh, uh, similarity structures in, 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 uh, in spaces like that. The, so some spaces would be, would be three-dimensional, like your color space, space yes. which is like a wheel with, with two cones, but other spaces can be two-dimensional, like when you yes. talk about hot, hot and cold. 
Yeah, no, that's one dimension and only. And many, many dimensions are, are one dimensional. Uh, and then uh, there are difficult spaces like like shapes. I mean, shape is very complicated. You have round things, you have pointed things, you have uh, star shaped things and so on. We don't really know how to, how to describe shape space mathematically, but we know that things are similar. I mean, a, a star is more similar to, uh, I don't know what, I mean, <laughs> uh, or, or, uh, the shape of an apple is more similar to that of a pear than to that shape of a pencil. I mean, we can we know that there are similarity relations. So probably there is something like shape space, but we don't really know how to how to define it in mathematical terms. People have tried, but it's it's a difficult problem. Yeah, and and, and do you think that that these um, these sort of shape sort of spaces we have in our mind, do you think that they are they form sort of a part of the brain which is very almost like prehistoric? It's it's something that, that existed before language existed? Yeah, yeah I mean, take color. I mean, that's really prehistoric. I mean, it existed way before. Uh, lots of animals have color perception, and they can classify things by, by colors. They have to know whether a fruit is ripe or not. I mean, then you have to judge the color of the fruit. Uh, so lots of these th spaces are way be appear in our evolution way before language did. And that's a point of mine that, that the language, the meaning of words depend on structures that are already available in, in, in our brains. Some of them we learn through culture. I mean, we, can, we have lots of kinship terms in, in, uh, in, in languages. I mean, talking about relatives and so on. And uh, they are partly culturally dependent. We can't, we can't see whether somebody is an uncle or not. We have to learn it uh, somehow. Um, but most, many of these spaces are, are yeah, uh, established way before we uh, know anything about language. Yeah, interesting. It, it's it's funny though, but if I if to use your specific example, if I if I think about my family relations, you know, in my mind I do visualize a tree, but exactly. I don't I don't know if that's the opposite. If 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 the language has led to the visualization or the other way around. But it, a tree can also be seen as a kind of spatial structures. There are similarities. You're more similar to your sister than you are to your great great aunt. I mean, it's a, there are distances in these spaces as uh, as well, and these distances are used when we classify classify uh, our our relatives. So the, the, you can say that kinship terms also correspond to regions of this kinship tree. Yeah, interesting. So I was wondering if. Apart from the, the color and the temperature, do you have any more examples of some of these spaces, maybe to help people really understand? Yeah, shape space. Shape space is important. I mean, even though I can't describe it, it's important because when children are learning language, learning the first nouns of, of the la their mother tongue, the, the shapes of objects are very, very important. I mean, you learn the shape of a duck, and even if it's a plastic duck in, duck in your bathtub, you call it a duck because you recognize it by the shape. I mean, the color is maybe bright yellow. It's not like any, any real duck, but it's the shape that is, de determines the meaning of, of the word duck uh, for, for when, when children learn the meaning. And then, of course, as you grow up, as you learn more things about duck, it, you know that it's much more than the, the shape that's, uh, that's important. Um, well, that's really interesting interesting you know i never thought about how a bathtub duck is bright yellow it's bizarre yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah wow yeah. interesting and and as well um is there any relationship between um the these sort of shapes where words exist and and sound symbolism like the way that words sound based on their there, there, there is a little bit of sound symbolism in, in all languages, but it's not, it's not very strong. I mean, there are some languages like Japanese or uh, the African language Wolof that has fa a fair amount of, of sound symbolism. But in general, our words are more or less arbitrary. They don't, uh, they don't describe, uh, they don't represent anything uh, in, in any way that looks like or sounds like the, the meaning of the word. So, do, do you, do you know if? If these kind of shape spaces, if if they're similar across all languages, or or is it only does this only apply to English? No, no, no. I, I mean, this is what I said. I mean, most of these basic uh, domains, as I call them, uh, or spaces, uh, they are common to all all all, all humans. I mean, uh, the colors, shapes, uh, sounds, 
sizes, uh, they're all common part of our perceptual mechanism. Then, of course, there are some cultural things. I mean, in some cultures you talk about uh, witches and, and uh, goblins and, and in other cultures you talk about other, other, other things. And so we have cr created some cultural spaces that, of course, differ. But for the basic part of language, we, we have a lot of things common because we're all human and, and we all have the same perceptual uh, mechanisms. Well, that sort of brings me on to my, my next question, which is, is there sort of a, a, a crossover between these conceptual spaces and maybe like metaphor, like in, in sense, in terms of like, you know, what, what Lakoff proposed, like, for example, you know, up is good and down is bad. Is it, is it, is there a crossover between? Yeah, there, there, there is a relation. I, I used my spaces to analyze metaphor because when you talk about the metaphor, you, you use another space to talk about uh, a, a more abstract thing. So just to take a simple example, um, when you listen to musical tones, we use the term high and low tones. I mean, this is one of Lakoff's examples. Uh, so for us, uh, this vertical dimension, high, low, is mapped onto our perception of the sound. I mean, the, the, the sound is not literally high and not literally low. This is a metaphor. And for us, it's so obvious. I mean, we learn this, this mapping from the vertical dimension to sounds when we are kids, and we, we don't think about it as a metaphor. But then if you look at another language, I mean, I, I happen to know that in Turkish, the tones are not high and low, they are thin or thick, which is a different metaphor. What we call a high tone is, is thin in, in um, Turkish, and what we call a low tone is, 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 is thick. That's a different mapping. It's still a metaphor, but it's a, another way of conceptualizing the meaning of high and low tones. So we know what perceptually they mean, but we, can, we have to describe them with, with other words. We use a metaphor to describe the distinction. Yet to give you another rather funny example I learned about recently is that for us, it's so obvious that May comes after April, and April com comes after March. We use this after and before. This is a temporal temporal relation, and, and it's so obvious. But in Chinese or in Mandarin, uh, May comes under April. Uh, so the, the, the months are like this. They write the months, January, February, March, April, and so on. For them, writing is, is vertical. Uh, and so, so May comes under April. And that's a different preposition, uh, but it's a metaphor, of course. Uh, oh, so, so maybe we have like um, language and meaning, and then we have metaphor, but these conceptual spaces are like another layer of abstraction, almost. Metaphors are mapping uh, abstract notions onto more concrete spaces, but sometimes you you can choose the space you map onto. I mean, high, low, or thin, thick is is a choice of of uh, of what kind of mapping you're doing in your language. And of course, you have to be aware of these mappings when you when you teach another language. I mean, that uh, in, in most Indo-European languages we use high and low for for tones, for instance, and we use before and after for for temporal temporal relations. But as I just given you examples, there there are languages who don't, uh, which don't have these, um, these uh, mappings, have other mappings. Do, do you think that, um, that some of your ideas could be used as a basis for, for teaching? Um, because, you know, a lot of teaching, a lot of language teaching starts with grammar. So you sort of yeah. learn grammar and then you sort of put in vocabulary into the correct sort of structure. Mm -hmm. But but maybe this is a different way to view language completely? Uh, for me, semantics are organized in these domains. I mean, there are color words, there are shape words, there are size words, and so on. And when you go to kindergarten, they, they, they practice kids on these color words. They have one week when they're practicing color words, next week they're practicing number words, and, 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 and so on. And maybe that's a good idea even in, in, in second language uh, teaching, uh, to, to focus on the domain and look at the structures. I mean, look at, say, kinship terms. What are, what are the English kinship terms? I mean, there are differences between Swedish and, and English in, in, in our terms. I mean, you have grandfather and grandmother. We make a distinction between father's father and mother's father and has different terms for this. Uh, so this is something you have to be aware of, the differences in, in how you partition uh, the domain. And even color terms are different in different uh, languages, even if um, most Indo-European languages have a f basically overlapping color terminology. Do, do you think it would be possible to produce a kind of 
like an index or a map of of all of the these spaces that you believe that exist that you could then use is that, maybe that's for an the, impossible task for the basic ones yes i mean the kinship you could go draw this tree of kinship terms and then you could mark which ones are called aunt which ones are called cousin because that that is differs in different uh, different languages uh, and you some languages have very fine terminology some are have rougher ones uh, and you could use, I mean, this is like using Pictionaries. I mean, Pictionaries are a way of describing the meaning of duck by drawing a duck. Uh, you can describe color terms by having a color space and then say what is what it's called in, 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 in different languages. Uh, so extending the idea of Pictionaries to, to include all the entire domains, the entire spaces would be a good thing, I think. How does, how does this idea work with more kind of abstract concepts like love or hate or that don't seem to, you know, you can't touch them or see them or... No, that, that, that's, that's problematic because these abstract terms we have, we, have, we don't have very good mental images of them and, and, and uh, they are really our democracy for that, for that matter. I mean, it's another w difficult uh, term or inflation. I mean, inflation means blowing up a balloon, but what has that to do with, with, uh, with economy? I mean, uh, well, everybody so, knows that democracy is, is an American flag with an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I mean th that's difficult. The most abstract terms, but mm, for concrete words, more concrete, more more down to earth words, I think th this this strategy could could be of some help. What do you see as some of the future directions of this research? Like what? Where do you sort of go from here? I mean, you, you you prompted me to think a little bit about applications for a second language teaching. I haven't really thought about it. And and I, I think that there could be some ideas I could, uh, but I haven't developed them at all. So that's something I may think about in the future. I have been involved in, in uh, programs of developing robots and teaching robots to, to speak, I mean, to communicate. Uh, to teach them to speak is not, not a problem because the speech generation programs are very good at the moment and, and, and uh, that's not a problem. The problem is to have them speak meaningfully and, and be able to communicate with people. And then you have to understand a lot about these metaphors and, and, and a very different thing, difficult thing for a robot is to understand pronouns. Because I've been talking about the person, and then I refer back to her with she. Uh, ten sentences, ten sentences later, and how can the robot know that what uh, am I referring to? I mean, that's it's a very difficult problem. As humans, we don't think about how we solve it. We do it extremely efficiently. Prepositions are that's one of the more difficult things to learn when you're learning a, se a second language because prepositions are very different between languages. Uh, uh, just to give you very trivial examples, in English, you you say that. Um, the stars are in the sky. And, and in Swedish we say, and in German you say, they're on the sky. The, and in English you say, the fly is on the ceiling. And in Swedish we say, it's in the ceiling. So it's a total reversal of on and in in these, uh, these applications. That's, you have to learn these, uh, these cases. It's, there is nothing natural to it. Uh. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the way that, the way that I teach that, because the, the second problem in English is the way that we use these prepositions in phrasal verbs. And so yes. learners, you know, learners, they, they look at a dictionary of phrasal verbs and they think, oh, my God, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. And um, so the way I teach it is, is, is I kind of use the metaphor. I say, for example, in is about, you know, you have a space and yeah, something yeah. exists inside that space. Um, and that's why I'm really interested in, in this idea of conceptual spaces, because because I was reading recently about there's this Polish um Linguist, I can't remember her name. I think you're uh, talking about Vyashbiska. I think so. And she, she developed oh, these yes. things called semantic primes. Yes, I, I know them. Yes, yes. That would be a fantastic basis for a textbook instead of grammar. You know? Yeah. My, my program is a little bit different. I mean, she has these 30, 40, I don't know, primitive, semantic primitives. I... Instead of these, I do the uh, the spaces. Uh, so I, I categorize these semantic 
uh, structures in terms of these domains or spaces, colors, shapes, and so on, uh, and use them to de to define uh, the meanings of different uh, different words. It doesn't work so well with nouns because nouns they have different properties. A dog has a size and a shape and a smell and a sound and a weight, and I mean it has properties in all all kinds of domains. But for adjectives and verbs, it, it works quite well. I, I think it could be a fantastic basis for for, for second language learning. Absolutely. Even if it was to just, as you say, even if it just clarified the differences between a native language and a... Um, but to go back to my example with the stars in the sky, I mean, in English, you, you, you perceive the sky as a, a container. So it's in the sky. And, and, and Swedish German has on the sky because we, we rely on the old picture that the sky was some kind of surface where the, the stars were stuck in, the, in, this, uh, in this surface. That's why they're on the sky. I, I wondered if I could just ask you a sort of a more personal question because um, you obviously speak English fantastically. Um, <laughs> did, did you, can you tell me a little bit about your, your experience with learning English? <laughs> it's very complicated because I, at school, they try to teach us the Queen's English, I mean, the, the British uh, version. Then I spent a year as a PhD student at Princeton in, in the United States. And more recently, I've spent extended periods in Australia and in South Africa. So I have no idea what my, my, my English sounds like in, in terms of, of dialect or what, whatever. But um, of course, I've been exposed to English. I write in English. I, I talk English to my PhD students. We have foreign PhD students. So English is working language for me very much i was wondering like um how that process was for you because you know i know that you know a, a lot of students you know they they maybe they they start to learn and then they realize how difficult it is and they give up or yeah. or maybe they they have an experience in the classroom where to them language is all just about memorization my experience was that when I finished high school, I mean, I, I we had a fair, fairly good education. I could read English without any problems. My spoken English wasn't very good. And then I spent this academic year in in, in the United States, and then I practiced. I mean, I, I was stuttering, I was stumbling, but after this year, I was more, much more fluent in English. And then after that, I mean, I spent a lot of my life. Uh, the, talking, writing English. Yeah? What, what, what would you say to any kind of student out there who is maybe, um, you know, has maybe been trying to learn English for years and they've failed and, uh, you know, what, what's the sort of, and I know that this is not your field of expertise, but do you have any advice for that kind of student? When I was a young student, I was kind of shy. So I was, I was afraid of speaking English. Yeah? But I think the, the, um, the best advice of, from my point of view is don't be shy, just try your best. And it doesn't matter if you fail, if you make mistakes and so on. It, the important thing is that you can communicate, that you can get your ideas, your desires uh, through to, to somebody else. Uh, uh, don't be shy, don't be afraid of making mistakes. I think that's a, a very important thing. And then by practicing, you, you, you improve your English. I, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know that you're a busy man. Um, and I just want to say thanks so much for, for for generously uh, donating your time today. Well, thanks for a very interesting chat, and I hope you got some ideas about how to use conceptual spaces in your in your uh, education. I did, thank you, and I'm looking forward to, to this gigantic map you're going to produce for us <laughs> that details all of the spaces. <laughs> okay. <laughs>